Thank you. Well, I'm delighted to be here to kick us off and talk to you about my area of research, which is called human-animal interaction. So basically, this stems from the idea that animals capture our attention. So evolutionarily, we would have grown up around animals and nature, but today we live in this hectic and technology-driven world, and we spend a lot of time in rooms like this where there's no animals and there's no nature, and I'm curious about what effect this might have on our mental health and wellness. So even though we don't spend a lot of time around animals in the same way that we used to, we still seek that out. And one of my favorite examples of this is the zoo. So every year, people pay money and travel just to spend the day staring at animals in the zoo. And in the US and Canada, the number of people who do this is more than the number of people who go to all major professional sporting events combined. So it's a really pervasive cultural phenomenon, this idea that we want to look at animals. And they're even infiltrating the sports world. So have you heard of the Puppy Bowl? Yes, it's the most watched cable television show each time that it airs. And it, in the middle of the Super Bowl, puppies are watched for about an hour, just romping around, doing nothing. So now not only do we pay to watch them in the zoo, we'll sit at home and watch them on TV. And in addition to that, we will come together and watch them at festivals. This is a real thing, the Internet Cat Video Festival. I think it's in about its 10th year now. People do travel and spend money now just to watch animals together. And there are even animal celebrities. I don't know if you've heard of Grumpy Cat, but we have famous animals now. So in these ways, they're really pervasive in our culture. And in addition, we allow animals to live with us in our houses. So in the United States, about 62% of households house as a companion animal. And it is not cheap. So animals do not pay rent, they do not cook you dinner. My animal does not anyways. And yet we're willing to shell out money for their toys, for their accessories, for their veterinary medical bills. And on the face of it, it's, it's not entirely clear what we are getting in return. I'm not sure what it might be, at least financially. And that's what drives research in this area to try and find out why are 62% of people in the US having an animal that doesn't pay rent live in their house. And so one of the core things that started to come out of this research is that animals provide social support. So we know from human health research that social support is related to a number of health outcomes. And animals can provide that in a couple of ways. The first is that animals provide direct support. So if you come home from work, your animal does not care if you look terrible, if your boss hates you, if you did bad on a test, your animal, perhaps a dog, might be wagging its tail, just excited to see you and gives you that non-judgmental support. And in addition to that, animals help connect us to those around us. So if you're walking your dog, you're much more likely to have someone smile and say hello than if you're just walking by yourself. So they facilitate social interactions between humans and help connect us to our community. And these are really important aspects of health to have this social support. So I experienced this firsthand recently. This is the first dog that I've owned and I have had her for almost a year now and I bring her to work with me and I am so much more popular now than I was before I had her. All of a sudden people just want to come by my office and just have a question for me. That did not happen before. And even our most, one of our most important scientists who's very busy and doesn't have time for much of anything just happens to need to come by my office a lot more often now. This is Dr. Alan Beck. And one of the reasons for this is that animals change the way people perceive us. They make us look better. So I don't know what you thought I looked like before, but the research suggests that now that you've seen me with my dog Milo, you should see me as friendlier, happier, more approachable, and less threatening. Is that the case? Are you perceiving me better now? I hope so. I did that on purpose. So, all right, so they make us look better. What else? Is that important? Who cares if animals make us look better? Who cares if I'm a little more popular now that I have a dog at work? Does that influence my health and well-being? Well, a few studies had some dramatic findings, and one showed that people who own pets were more likely to survive a heart attack after controlling for the severity of the disease and other factors. Another study showed that you're less likely to take medication for heart problems or sleeping difficulties if you have an animal. So these were concrete things that even the National Institutes of Health in the US recognized. And they made this statement in 1987 that said no future study of human health should be considered comprehensive if we don't include the animals with whom people share their homes. So they've made this mandate in 1987. As far as I can tell, not everyone is following this and not everyone is including animals in their studies, but it is something that I think is important to consider.
So today I'm going to talk to you about how this relates to autism, because this is an area of particular interest, I think, to everyone in the room as well to myself. And what we see here is this is the idea of how animals may help people. They may help connect us socially. So for individuals with autism, one of the core challenges is interacting socially and feeling comfortable with the people around you. And a couple of studies have shown that children with autism seek out and enjoy contact with animals. So the idea might be that we could use this as a stepping stone to help connect children with autism to those around them. So green all around, this may be a way to increase social interaction for children with autism. A, they may have that non-judgmental support of the animal who doesn't necessarily care if they're not making eye contact, and B, we may be able to help connect them socially to those around them. So this is not a new idea. You may have seen these things in the news, in the media. Raise your hand if you've seen a story in the news or a movie or a book that had to do with children with autism and animals. Okay, it's very common. I see a lot of it these days. And as a researcher and a scientist, I see this and I am very skeptical because it looks far too good to be true. And these are magical cases that are being presented. So as any curious individual does, I conducted a systematic review on the topic to find out what empirical evidence we actually have to support this. So I looked at studies around the globe that were published in English. And what I found is that Researchers around the U.S. and the globe are studying this. This is not a unique phenomenon to the U.S., but people around the globe are studying this topic. And what I also found is this is a growing area. So we've got one study in 1989, another not until 2002, and it's only in recent years that we're seeing more studies on this topic. And last year, we did an update on this, and what we found is that in the past two years, the number of studies on this topic has over doubled in size. So it's certainly an area of growing interest for the research world. Well, what, is it, what do we find? Do, do the findings in the research map on to what we see in the news and the media? Well, I would say it's definitely too soon to tell. We're seeing really small studies, a lot of variability. As a, as a researcher, I'm not convinced from the small number of studies that have been conducted so far. We do see that a lot of them are showing increased social interaction, but it's so varied. You know, in some cases we have a horse outside, in some cases we have a rabbit inside, in some cases we have a service dog in the home. There are so many different factors that it's really tough to say. Was it the animal that made this difference, or was it a really talented clinician, or was it the whole program? I'm still not convinced from what I've seen that we have evidence as yet. So what I decided to do with my research group was do a proof of concept study. So that means I wanted to know, is there any evidence to this concept that we should have an animal there? Let's take away everything else, no talented therapist, no specialized program. If I just stick an animal in front of a child with autism, what happens? And I was very curious to see what we could compare that to. Because if you have an animal there, you may act different. But if you have anything else there, you may act different. If you had a video game there, if you had toys there, if it was anything else, it may make a change. So I wanted to compare the animal to something else that's fun and engaging. So luckily for me, that is a multi-million dollar industry, creating things that are fun and engaging for children. These are toys. And so in one condition, I had the animal. In the other, I had the toys. In this study, I worked with 99 children between the ages of 4 to 12. And a third of the sample were children with autism spectrum disorder. And the other two-thirds were typically developing children. So I worked in classroom settings, mainstream inclusion classrooms, and I would select the one child with autism in the class and then randomly pick out two other of their typically developing peers so that we could have this peer network group to look at social interactions. And as with all interactions with an animal, you should always have adult supervision. So be assured that we had that included here as well. So we had the animal condition and the toy condition. Now, this is the animal that we selected for this study. Can anyone take a guess at what you think that might be? I'm going to assume that all of you got it correctly because I could not hear you. So it is a guinea pig. The reason we selected guinea pigs is while it might be really exciting and fun to have a horse in the classroom, it's probably not feasible. So we selected guinea pigs because of their size, their suitability to being in the classroom environment, and the ease of which caring for them can be. So, in our animal condition, 
we had two animals, two guinea pigs. They're social animals. They require that sort of companionship from the animal side. And a range of materials you might use when engaging with guinea pigs. So these will be fruits and vegetables to feed them. This, to the novice eye, might look like trash and toilet paper rolls, but use your imagination. This is actually what we can use to create tunnels and enrichment activities for the animals. Um, you could groom them, weigh them, draw pictures of them, or write down things about them. So this is the animal condition. These materials were spread out in front of a group of three children, and it was said, you have 10 minutes of free time. See what happens. In the toy condition, I went out and got what I what was I was told were the hottest toys that children were buying a lot at the time for both males and females across the age range. And it's roughly the same number of items that we had in the animal condition. And here we place these toys in front of the children and say, you have 10 minutes of free time and see what happens. So the children participated in these groups of three with the adult supervision. And they had three sessions in each condition, and all of it was video recorded so that we could look back later and see exactly what was happening. And here's what we found. So we were primarily looking at social behaviors. Now, when you look at social behaviors, this can take a number of different forms. So we had three main forms. The first one is talking. So if I'm talking to you, I'm probably engaging with you socially. The next is looking, and we were really strict about this. It had to be looking at people's faces and touching, so that would be a high five, a hug, coming, our shoulders brushing. So we looked at three, these three social behaviors across the animal and the toy conditions. And what we found is that when the animal was there, the children with autism were talking significantly more. They were also looking at people's faces more, and they were touching more, so coming into physical contact with people more often. So behaviorally, what we saw is that the children actually were engaging in more social behaviors without any sort of therapeutic intervention, just simply by having the animal there. We also looked at some emotions, and we found that children with autism smiled significantly more often with the animal there, they laughed more often, and they were less likely to frown, cry, or whine, and they were more pro-social. So that means they were helping people more often. And so what I find interesting about this is that we're comparing this to toys, which are designed for children to smile and to laugh and to engage. So I do think that we had a pretty strict comparison and still the children were smiling and laughing more often with the animal. So another thing we were interested in is that's what we see on the face of it, but what's happening underneath? What might be the mechanism for this? And so when I first showed you this picture, did you see the physiological assessment device in it? You may, you may see it now that I've drawn your attention to it, but this wristband actually tracks physiological arousal. So many years ago, if I wanted to conduct, or not even that many years ago, if I wanted to conduct this research, the children would have had to give me blood samples, urine samples, or I would have needed them to be hooked up to wires. And as you can imagine, if you're interacting with an animal, that's not necessarily the easiest thing to do when you have wires attached, nor is it the easiest thing to do to go into a school and ask for urine samples. So I was very delighted that technology has advanced to the stage where I could get continuous physiological arousal with a simple wristband. So we had these on the children. And we looked at their arousal using skin conductance. So if it's higher, that means higher arousal. That means they could be really excited or anxious. And if it's lower, they could be calm, but they could also be bored. And that's one of the challenges with looking at physiological arousal is that you don't necessarily know if it's positive or negative. So what we did is we asked the children to tell us how they felt. And this is pretty standard to ask the children to point to how they're feeling during each of the conditions. And with that, we can see whether it's positive or negative, the arousal. So what we found is that when children were with the animals, they reported feeling significantly happier than when they were with the toys. And then we looked at their arousal and we found that they had significantly lower arousal when they were with the animals compared to the toys. So what this may mean is that they are in fact feeling a positive state of calm because they're feeling happy, but also at a lower arousal. So when I come back to this initial idea of testing whether the animal is something fun and engaging beyond the toys, what I see is that for children with autism, we're seeing increased social behaviors and reduce physiological arousal. So it may be that if you're not feeling as anxious and stressed as usual, you may be a little more open to smiling and laughing and engaging with your peers.
But it's important to note that this is just one study. So this is just an initial look at this. So I certainly would not suggest that this is a treatment for autism or anything of that nature. What I would say that we can say at this point is that it may be a complement to existing evidence-based practices. And it's certainly something that we need to have further research on to know whether a guinea pig is the same as having a horse or a dog and what the differences might be and whether different children respond differently to different animals. So we're excited with what we have so far, but there's a lot still to do. And that's what we're doing here at the Center for Human-Animal Bond at Purdue is taking a look at these and other questions to look at how children with autism engage with animals and how we can help enhance that for those who may benefit. Thank you.